Hey, YouTube. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about an article that I wrote, which I think is very important, uh, which talks about the, um, the fact that databases are really, in my opinion, the end game for data oriented design. So it's a super interesting topic. Obviously, data oriented design um, has been very popular in game development recently and is even making its way to other uh, elements of programming. Um, and in this article, we're going to be talking about how databases um, have been thinking about this problem of data oriented design since the beginning and how they're not just a way to store and query data, um, which is persisted to disk, but really a much more powerful programming paradigm. The title's a little bit spicy. It basically says, Hey, databases are a better data oriented design more or less. And that's not the, the reason behind the blog post per se, but it is a way to get people to click on the blog post. Um, and, um, the main point of this blog post is really to highlight that a lot of what people are rediscovering in ECS and other, uh, types of paradigms, honestly, since time immemorial is already known about, and it's been known about since 1969, when a glorious man, uh, by the name of Edgar F. Codd, uh, proposed the relational model of data, data for databases. And obviously the relational model in mathematics goes like way beyond that as well. But we're really reinventing the wheel and we're giving ourselves a lot of pats on the back for a similar thing. Now it's not identical in terms of implementation, but my point here is to, is to demonstrate to people that, um, a lot of these things are, uh, they have the same theoretical foundation and that we should really recognize that and understand that so we can build better systems in the future. Because if we know what the theoretical foundation for the systems are that we're building, we know what their limitations are from a modeling perspective. And we know how, um, if we make a variation on it, we can accurately assess what the trade-offs we're making are. So maybe we're cha make, changing a little bit for performance. Maybe we're changing it a little bit, uh, to model a different set of, uh, different type of data. But if we know what the theoretical model is, we know what we're giving up or what we're gaining by making those changes. That's essentially the idea. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about how people think about databases essentially as, as I mentioned here, a way to store and query data, which is persisted to disk. And that is a very naive, I think, understanding of what the purpose of a database is. Um, and it's totally reasonable to understand why people feel that way. And the reason people generally tend to feel that way. It's just, that's the context in which they interact with them. Right. So in a lot of cases, people only deal with databases over a network, um, by sending it query strings and then getting data back. So they feel slow. That's like a, the slowest thing you can do with a computer. They parse and, and do all this crazy stuff. Um, and the only reason in some sense in people's minds is to actually have that data written to disk. But as I argue here, writing to disk is a incidental fact of, uh, how databases work. Um, it's just one additional feature. It's actually not the primary thing. The primary thing that they do is they organize your data. So if you're thinking about if, if really you want to take data oriented design seriously, you had better look at databases and understand how they deal with databases because data oriented design, for those of you who do not know, uh, was invented or at least um, proselytized, I suppose, by game developers who um, wanted to make their games go faster because the current uh, techniques weren't cutting it, namely object-oriented design. So with data-oriented design, the, go the idea is, look, um, the whole purpose of any program is to transform data from one type to another type. And we need to think about how our computers work and what the physical operations are that they're doing is, uh, so that we can design those transforms to be more efficient and to design them to also be more flexible so that we can choose how to transform our data without rewriting all of our code. That's essentially what data oriented design is. Uh, and if you're thinking about that you're thinking about, well, how do I organize my data, um, efficiently and how do I organize my data? So it's flexible to change. Um, that is exactly what databases were created to do. So, um, prior to 1969 and Edgar F. Codd's paper here, which I link, 
the way that people stored uh, data on disk was um, much the same way that people currently store data in memory. So it was a bunch of pointers. And uh, if you wanted to traverse the data, you had to write a program that would like look through the hierarchical structure of the data, like walk the graph more or less. Uh, and then if you wanted to change th th that, first of all, wasn't portable. So if you have your data in one machine, uh, you can't just copy it onto another machine. You have to uh, translate all the pointers from your one machine into the data of another machine. Uh, and if you wanted to change the way that you traverse data, you have to rewrite your program. So you had to write a program for every query you wanted to do of your database, which largely is how, by the way, in-memory data is organized currently in many programs, right? So when you write your program, you have a bunch of objects, you have an object graph, they point to each other, the, that the pointer data is mixed in with your application data so that you couldn't just take your data structure and copy it onto another machine. You have to serialize it and then deserialize it and all this stuff. Um, and this was exactly what uh, the relational model was designed to solve. In the relational model, there are no pointers. There are only relationships and they are part of your data. Um, so uh, the idea is we have tuples. They are in tables. Tables are collections of tuples. Tuples have columns, the, the, or in this case, fields. I'm not sure what you would call a tuple a field. Uh, and tuples can relate to other tuples uh, in that they share a value, essentially. So that's the relational model. It turns out, as is um, broken down by this article, so this is just going over what data oriented design is, but that ECS which is a very popular system in game design, which I'm sure, no doubt, you have all heard about. Uh, it turns out that ECS is really the relational model, but it's kind of a sort of a basic relational model. It, it's a, a less powerful, weak version of the relational model. But the idea for ECS is that um, you achieve two goals. One is you provide a data model which allows for complex data interactions, which allows for future additions or refactorings. For example, um, in the object-oriented paradigm that the people who came up with ECS were struggling with, uh, you have to decide who owns all of the data, like which objects own it, and then you have to figure out what verbs make sense where. So if I do damage to another player, is that a function that's on, or an enemy? Is that a function that's on my player? And I do damage, like I call the do damage function and then I pass in the enemy? Or is it the other way around? Am I calling the take damage function on an enemy and I'm passing in the player who should be doing the damage and all of this crazy stuff. And ECS was designed to say like, you know what, forget about all that nonsense. We're gonna have um, data laid out in a way that's gonna allow us to not make those decisions uh, up front and then be able to very quickly and efficiently change them. It's flexible. The other reason it was created was to efficiently arrange uh, data in memory because modern CPUs um, having uh, very uh, optimized cache efficiency is incredibly important for performance. So they wanted to do both of those things. And the way they did them, for those of you who are not familiar with ECS, is that basically the idea is you have entities which are an identifier that sort of uniquely identifies a thing in the world. They probably would have called them objects if objects had not been already taken by object-oriented programming at that time. ECS is from around, I think, like 1995 or something, uh, that kind of range. But you have an, an identifier, as you can see here. Um, and then you have a whole bunch of data that you associate with that identifier. So for example, if I have a person in my game, the way I would make them a person is I would create an entity. That entity has no data associated with it at first. Um, so it's, it's nothing. Then I would associate it with with that entity, like a position and a velocity and maybe a player. And then so now this entity will have a position and it'll have a velocity and it'll have a player. And you can compose these components together, hence the name, um, to create a uh, entity which has all of the properties you want. And then that takes us to the system. So a system is a way to filter out the appropriate entities that you want to operate over and then operate all over all of them. 
So for example, I might want to say I want to operate over all enemies. And so an enemy would have the position, velocity, and enemy component. And then um, I can say loop through all enemy, enemies and do that very quickly. The types of ways that you're able to filter is you can sort of specify, I want to look at all entities that have a position, a velocity, and an enemy. So you can look at the all entities that have a set of components, essentially. Uh, which is, it turns out, very similar to the relational model of data. It's actually um, sort of exactly how it works. So when we take a position and a velocity and an enemy and we add them together, that's essentially joining tables together. So if you have a position table and you have a velocity table and you have an enemy table and you join them all together on the entity, then you get a bunch of rows, which are just the rows that have all those components. Um, and so you can see, this is how we might do like a query. So we say like, hey, we're, we want this entity, we want this position, we want this velocity. And, and then we're gonna add position to the velocity and we can loop this um, function will be called on every matching entity every second or every 60th of a second. Um, but you can see we can do the same exact thing. This is where I go into, well, ECS is really weak sauce relational model. Uh, here's my fantastic uh, image of Mr. Edgar Codd, my, my favorite person uh, in the world. Um, you can see we can do the same thing in Postgres, right? So we can create an entity table, which just has an ID, which has a serial means auto incrementing, primary key means almost nothing um, in this particular case, but it means it's unique. Uh, we have a position which has a primary key that it's referencing as a foreign key. So this position must be associated or related, if you will, to a particular entity. A velocity, same thing. Player, same thing. Enemy, same thing. Uh, so you can see we can build the exact same system there. And then you can do what's called a join, an inner join to get all of the things that you want. So you, instead of doing matching rows, what you're going to do is you're going to query your rows in your database, and then you're going to operate over those rows. So you can think of a system in ECS as being a transaction, really a query plus a transaction, um, or you could think of it just as a query if you prefer. Um, a component is a table and an entity is a unique identifier which is in its own table. Although I note, I suppose you don't have to put it in its own table if you don't want to have a foreign key constraint. So then the question becomes, uh, well, is, are there details that are different in the implementation uh, than in ECS? And it's, it's, the answer is yes, there, there are. Um, but a lot of the optimizations that they do in ECS have actually been old optimizations that have happened in, in the relational model for a long time. So for example, um, ECS has the concept frequently of an archetype. And an archetype, I think maybe I mentioned archetype somewhere down here, database. So yeah, archetype. So if you go to, for example, unity dots, you'll see uh, references to archetypes. Archetype is basically pre-joining all the tables. So for example, I have an enemy archetype you have one archetype for every set of components that any entity has. So if there was position, velocity, and enemy, you might have position, position velocity, and player. You might have position in player. You might have position in enemy, for example. And each one of those is an archetype. Well, that's the same in a sense as pre-joining the table together. So that physically on disk, or in this case in memory, it's stored already together so that when you do that query and you join them they're already done it's already there's no need work needs to be doing done you just return all the rows that are already stored in that format so this is a this is a optimization that you can do in databases that is exactly what ecs already does so um yeah that's that's what we got going on there and this section is about saying you know people perceive databases to be slow but it's largely in the, the context in which they use them not that they are inherently slow, in that there are certain in-memory databases that do a crazy amount of uh, records per second. So like 356 million records per second. You're talking like a couple nanoseconds per record to iterate, to scan in your database, which is at ECS speeds. That's pretty high up there in terms of what you can actually do. 
I also highlight Hyper, which can do like almost a million serializable transactions per second. Some people saw this uh, and they said like, oh, a million per second, that's nothing. Because that's only like 20,000 or so per frame. Um, and we can do more than that in ECS. But I think what's not clear here is that these are serializable transactions. These are transactions, uh, very, very small ones. So we're not operating over, we're not doing rows per second. We're doing transactions per second. And these can be small transactions or big transactions. It's actually a smattering. That's what this TPCC is. Um, it uh, simulates basically a population of users executing a bunch of different transactions of different sizes against the database. Um, and serializable means that these are all completely isolated from each other. These are durable transactions. They're the whole nine yards. You get all of the niceness of databases. Uh, and then you can run them in parallel and they're serializable. So this scales up as you increase the number of cores. Um, which brings me to, I suppose, another point about databases, which is that there has been 50, 60 years of research about how to make these things go fast and multi-threaded. So you can take code that somebody wrote that's not multi-threaded and run it in a multi-threaded way, allowing you to go really, really fast and the user doesn't have to think about it. It's really the holy grail of what people have been talking about, about multi-threaded programming for a long time, which is how do we multi-thread people's applications without having them have all of the overhead of doing that themselves. So the ceiling, there's a ceiling on this is so high. Like we can do so much to make databases uh, work. And it's not even weird. It's obvious. If you know how ECS works, it's clear that you want to have ECS. So this then section is like, where do we go from here? Um, well, I mentioned space time DB because obviously it's relevant to what we do. And you can see here, this is the syntax that we'd like to move towards or something there about um, where you can say, hey, I want to, here's the update position system. So if we go back here, here's the ECS version. Up here, update position, and you match on entity position and velocity, and you just update the position and velocity. Uh, and then down here, uh, we have the same thing. So we match on position and velocity and for every one of these things. So we give you a little bit more control. You can actually control the loop instead of having to pass that off to someone else. Maybe we'll even do it so that um, you can give space and to be the control to the loop uh, and then we'll multi-thread it or something like that. So that would be pretty cool. Um, right now, each reducer is multi-threaded, but not, for example, the execution of this for loop. Um, you update the position, you just update it in the database and you're done. As time goes on, we want to be able to provide the user with various knobs. I have my, this is the end game with EdGraph Cod. These are my favorite. I, I really enjoyed making these, by the way. This is also EdGraph Cod. Um, in the future, we basically would like to make it so uh, you can choose the trade-offs you want. Do you not care about durability and you just want to go fast because you're doing a physics-based game? Do you not care about um, running multi-threaded because you want to optimize for single-threaded workloads? Do you not care about uh, transaction isolation? Maybe you want to run as fast as you can. You don't care if there's data problems because it doesn't really matter for the type of fast-paced game that you're dealing with. These are all things that have historically been hand-programmed, painful things that you have to re-architect your application to change. And in our case, it should be configuration. So I really stress configuration over uh, implementation. Uh, and um, that's what we would like to provide. Um, so all of this is to say that hopefully by the end of this article, if you read this article, you should it should be pretty obvious to you that not only is it not weird to run games and databases, but it's a better way and that we can actually get there. So, so yeah, so um, that's my take on databases and data-oriented design. I think there's a lot of promise in this area. Um, there's a huge amount of uh, improvements we can make to people's user experience uh, for making games. Uh, and not only that, also the performance of those games. Uh, I think we can enable small teams to make really, really ambitious projects. Uh, so I'm super excited to, to be working on that with SpaceTimeDB. Um, if you're interested in this or other uh, discussions that we might have about this type of thing, uh, please um, join our Discord. 
uh, give the uh, repository a star on GitHub um, or uh, subscribe to our Twitch and definitely subscribe to YouTube for more uh, videos about this. I'd also like briefly just to thank uh, Sander Mertens, who is the creator of Flex, um, who discussed with me some interesting things about this topic and did a quick proofread of this as well before it went out. And also uh, Phoebe as well for uh, inspiring and reviewing the post. And then Richard Fabian, who wrote an amazing book on data-oriented design.